Hey, Revelstoke Alliance Church, glad you could join us here. If my voice sounds a little bit funny, that's because I had COVID last week and I'm still kind of overcoming the uh, last little bit of uh, symptoms, but I am not infectious and definitely not via the video screen, so we are good. <clears throat> but if I cough or splutter or sound a bit croaky, that's why. All right, Gospel of Mark, part two. Uh, last week, we started a new sermon series in the Gospel of Mark, and in that we looked at uh, how Mark, who was the first person to write a gospel, used the same word gospel that the Caesars used to declare their own victories and successes. In fact, they even used these proclamations of good news to announce that they were in fact gods and that they should be worshipped. So the word gospel we've already seen, was a Roman political word meant for proclamation of good news. And then we thought about uh, what it meant uh, both then and now for Mark to say that actually Jesus and his way and not Caesar in his way is actually the gospel, the good news. Now, not only did Mark use a Roman political word to describe his book, but he also borrowed a genre of writing to communicate what he wanted to get across. You see, the genre of a book communicates something itself even before we start to consider the contents of the book. For example, here are uh, two different kinds of genres for you to consider. Here is a piece of writing, and this is the piece of writing I want you to think about. It says, for the first time, DSLR users, chapters 1 and 2, explain the camera's basic operations and shooting procedures. So what kind of genre is this? Well, it's obviously it's an instruction manual. And when you start to read this kind of writing in this genre, you're thinking it's primarily to impart information, to help uh, troubleshoot difficulties, to help uh, a a user understand how to use something and so it's not going to use poetry to do that imagine a book of poetry as the instruction manual of how to use your new camera you'd be very frustrated so the genre and the type of writing uh, communicate something that we to take this seriously we have to take it word for word we have to take it literally that's the genre now, how about this for a different kind of writing, a different type of communication and a different genre? What does this speak to you? What does this say to you? A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Now, for most of us, we instantly recognize that as Star Wars. It's the opening, opening line of, you know, all these different Star Wars movies. And we automatically understand, as soon as we see that, what kind of writing this is and how we're meant to interact with it. We know that it's going to be fictional. We know it's going to involve Jedis and stormtroopers and maybe a Wookiee or two. Um, we know that eventually the good guys are going to win unless it's the Empire Strikes Back. Um, and so, you know, we approach that writing with a certain level of what is going to be communicated to us. You shouldn't read a fairy story the same way you read a demand from your bank uh, as they say you should pay your overdue bills. You should not read those two types of writing the same way. Genre, you see, adds meaning through its commonality. It helps you put the words you're about to read into perspective, into a framework. And that's the same with the books of the Bible. The Bible is a collection of books, 66 books, written over a period of about 1,500 years from the first book to the last, so a long time, written in three different languages and on three different continents. And these books, these 66 books, are written in different genres to help the reader grasp the meaning of the thoughts being communicated. So poetry, songs, laws, history, wisdom, letters, and sermons are just a few of the genres that you'll find in the Bible. Now, you should not read a poem the same way you read a set of laws. Neither should you read a set of laws the same way you should read a poem. So what genre, then, are the Gospels? Now, they fall under a broad umbrella of a genre that's called Greco-Roman biography. They're biographies, ancient biographies. Not quite the same as a historical biography today, but close. So you see, the writers in ancient Greece and Rome would take the life of take the life events of a famous person and then pick and choose which of them they wanted to include in the biography 
and then string those events together in a story or a narrative to tell you something about that person's life and character. The writers of ancient biography were less interested in what we would call history, you know, sort of the factual events in a sort of a chronological order, uh, but they were much more interested in giving their readers a moral lesson based upon the subject's life. They were written to give the reader wisdom for life rather than simply historical facts. You see, as much as Roman culture prized power, might, and dominance as being the chief amongst the virtues, uh, Greek culture prized wisdom and insight and life's purpose. Now, one of the most famous writers of uh, ancient Greco-Roman biographies, Plutarch, uh, he wrote a collection of biographies, biographies called Lives, uh, fittingly enough. And this is what he said about his own book, Lives. This is Plutarch. I began the writing of my lives for the sake of others, but I find that I'm continuing the work and delighting in it now for my own sake also using history as a mirror and endeavoring in a manner to fashion and adorn my own life in conformity with the virtues therein depicted. So Greek biographies were written and read to pass on wisdom. Now, ancient writing that fell into this category, this genre of biography, had certain similar features. That's what genres are. They have similar features. Uh, these were some of these features of ancient um biography. The biography was a narrative prose concentrating on the main protagonist and his interaction with secondary characters. The prose moved forward in a chron chronological time frame. The primary character included teachings to highlight his life. It also included any miracles or additional tales that highlight aspects of the main character's life. And most importantly, it almost always detailed an honorable death of the protagonist. So the very first readers of the gospel, seeing they were written in the style of biography that they would have been used to, expected a few things from the gospel of Mark as soon as they started reading it. They expected they would find the biography of Jesus and his actions and his teachings and his miracles. They would expect to learn wisdom lessons from all of those features lessons to help you live a more purposeful and meaningful life. Uh, and we definitely find those things in the Gospels. However, in almost every single ancient Greek biography, the writer would include a glorious and noble death scene, showing how the death of the subject, you know, the character, lined up with their lives and their actions and their philosophies. So can you imagine the shock of a young Greek person reading the Gospels for the first time. Life of Jesus? Check. Teaching and miracles? Check. Wise lessons for life? Check. Honorable death? Uh-oh, not an honorable death. The shocking thing for the Greek reader was that Jesus was killed in the least honorable way possible. He was convicted as being a public menace, he was mocked, spat on, betrayed, lied about, whipped, abandoned by his friends. And then, to add insult to injury, he was crucified between two criminals. There was no honor there at all. For the Greek reader of the Gospel of Mark, the death of Jesus would make no sense at all. Where was the lesson to be learned there? Where is the honor in his death? It would have taken our Greek reader totally by surprise. By using this ancient biographical biography genre, Mark is forcing his first century readership to stop in their tracks and consider what honor or glory or victory does such a dishonorable death bring. What does this say about Jesus? What does that say about his followers? How should they live in the light of such a death? And that is still something we in our day and our age, we have to wrestle with as well. Now, just as using the word gospel would cause the first century reader to stop and ask themselves who has the true authority and power to issue such a proclamation, Jesus or Caesar, using Greco-Roman biographies, the genre also asks the question, who actually has wisdom, the knowledge and insight and how to live life with meaning and purpose? Who has wisdom, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, or Jesus? 
You see, because we are 2,000 years and 10,000 kilometers removed from these events, we can easily lose the context and the power of the message long written down. Power and wisdom not to be found in Caesar, Augustus, and Aristotle, but power and wisdom are to be found in Jesus. Now, let's read the next few verses of the Gospel of Mark as it kind of unfolds the story. So Mark 1 verse 1 is what we read last week. I'll start there again, repeat it. Mark 1 verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So, here we go in verses 2 and 3. We have an additional layer of complexity. Our Roman reader is expecting a political proclamation, a gospel. Our Greek reader is expecting a biography of Jesus, a life story in order to gain wisdom. Now instead, Mark opens up his gospel biography with some Jewish Old Testament scriptures. So for the original Jewish readers, what would this have meant for them? No, the original readers or listeners who were Jewish would have instantly recognized these verses that were being quoted. They would know they would have known their context and they would have been either captivated or utterly offended by them. Why? Well, although Mark says, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, he actually combines one verse from the prophet Malachi and one verse from the prophet Isaiah. Now, both of these verses are talking about the coming Messiah, the savior of the Jewish nation, the person who will restore glory to all of Israel. But when you go back and read those quotes in the original Old Testament books, you start to understand exactly what Mark was saying to the Jewish readers of this gospel. So we should probably do the same. Let's go back and have a look at the quote uh, from Malachi within its context. This is Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. Sounds good so far. God's going to send a messenger who's going to precede the coming of the Messiah. And this messenger is going to prepare the way, get things ready for the arrival of the Messiah. The only problem is the rest of the book of Malachi is one of the longest sort of like furious, dangerous, direct rebuke to the nation of Israel about their compromise, about their spiritual lukewarmness, about their half-hearted obedience to God. In short, they were not ready at all to meet with God. So this messenger in Malachi 3 is there not just to announce some good news about the Messiah coming. He's there to put things right, to call the people to repentance for their sins and for their compromises before God. Chapter 3 of Malachi continues in this way. Chapter 3, verse 2. But who can endure the day of the Lord's coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he'll be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. So I will come to put you on trial. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers and adulterers and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive the foreigners among you of justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. So the gospel, the good news, is the Messiah is coming. But that means for the people he is coming to, they need to get themselves right before God. Otherwise, there will be judgment. Now, the Jewish readers of Mark chapter 3 and verse 2 would instantly know that. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. They instantly know what that means for them. Now, I would love for you to take 10 minutes this week and read the entire book of Malachi to see what I mean, to see what the call of for Israel to Israel in terms of repentance and cleaning up their act um, before the Messiah comes, what that call is. 
Now, Mark didn't stop with quoting just Malachi. He added a quote from Isaiah 2. And the quote from the Gospel of Mark says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So let's open up Isaiah and see what it says there within its context. Maybe it's another call for repentance, another warning about compromise or sin. This is Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 to 3. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all of her sins. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. So Isaiah is a message of comfort, of peace, of forgiveness of sins. It's just amazing that Mark put these two verses together as a way to explain what Jesus was going to do and how we should respond. We need to repent of our sins and be open to receive the comfort of forgiveness won for us by Jesus. And because we, you and I, are not first century Jews, because we don't know our Old Testament as well as we should, it's very easy to entirely miss what God was saying through Mark to his readers. Repent, and then you'll receive comfort. So let's read these three verses again and listen for the interplay between Jesus' gospel and Caesar's, the interplay between the wisdom of the Greeks and the true wisdom of God, and the interplay in the clear message from the Hebrew scriptures. The Messiah is coming. Repent, change your hearts, rearrange your priorities. Open yourself up to what God is about to do and you'll receive consolation and peace and forgiveness from your sins. Your sinful, broken heart will be healed and comforted. That's all in the first three verses. Mark 1 verses 1 to 3. In the beginning, sorry, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. The Roman reader, the Greek reader, the Jewish reader, all confronted in unexpected ways in the first three verses alone. That's before Jesus has said or done anything. Just wait till Jesus gets going. He confronts and he consoles in equal measure all the way through the gospel. Now let's read today a little bit further in the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark. Who was this messenger who will prepare the way for Jesus, who will make straight paths for him? And what was his message for the people back then? What did he want them to do? And for us today, if our heart is open to it, how does God want us to respond to that message, that power, that wisdom, that salvation that belongs to Jesus? So this is Mark 1, verses 4 to 8. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to meet him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the, comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So you're looking for the right way to live, the right way to interact with God, the right way to interact with other people, the right way to interact with yourself. Or are you looking for strength in your life to pursue what is before you, for wisdom in your life to know which path to take, for peace and comfort in your life from your past decisions and choices? Then listen to John the Baptist. Repent and be baptized in water. Trust in Jesus by faith and you'll receive salvation for your soul and strength and wisdom for your life and experience the baptism in the Spirit. So what would the original Roman, Greek, and Jewish readers of Mark understood? 
they would have understood so far and just in the opening few verses that it was Jesus and not Caesar. Jesus and not Plato. Jesus and not Moses. But only Jesus is the Messiah. Strength, wisdom, and salvation come from Jesus alone. Amen. Now, the next sermon in the book of Mark, we're going to read about what happened when Jesus himself was baptized. And then how he went toe-to-toe with Satan. And also the content of Jesus' very first public message for all humanity. So the gospel according to Mark, a Roman political statement, a Greek biography filled with Jewish prophecies about a Messiah, truly a message for everyone. Praise the Lord.